Forever Young would like to acknowledge the support of these sponsors. The Fun and Fitness Travel Club, which began at a neighborhood pool in Fairfax County, has become a nationwide travel club for active adults. Led by certified fitness instructors Jim Seeley and Cynthia New, this dues-free organization travels worldwide on cruises and land tours, offering members free daily exercise classes in water aerobics, tai chi, yoga, deck walking, ballroom dancing, and sing-alongs. The website is fun-fitness.com and the phone number is 703 8270414 You make me feel so young You make me feel like spring sprung Every time I see you grin I'm such a happy a individual the moment that you speak I want to run way high and see I want to go and bounce the moon just like a big balloon Thank you very much to Dick Mathia for uh, coming to our show today. Thank you kindly. Can everybody hear me? Good. Uh, I want to thank our... Uh, he, Jim has to be the tallest leprechaun I know. <laughs> James Michael o. Francis O'Sullivan Seely and Forever Young TV. And thank you all for coming out on such a beautiful day. I'm sure that with this nice weather... A big surprise today. You'd much rather be walking out there, but to thank you for coming, and I'm delighted to be here. My name is Dick Methia, and I'll give you just a little bit of background on who I am and why I'm here. In 1985, President Ronald Reagan decided that civilians were going to fly aboard the space shuttle, and he decided that because of their importance, the first set of civilians would be teachers. So a call went out in 1985 to find that first teacher in space. 16,000 teachers from around the world applied. Now, I was one of those crazy people. My wife said, honey, you're absolutely out of your mind. But I said, this is something that sounds so exciting, sweetheart. I have just got to try. And with 16,000 applicants, Come on, I mean, what are my chances? Over the course of a year, it was kind of like an American Idol competition, except <laughs> it was very difficult, and there was a national selection panel and a whole bunch of NASA people in the process, and I was blessed to end up being one of the 10 top national finalists. Wow. So I got a lot of NASA training. I met a lot of astronauts who continue to be my dear friends, You've got to remember that we are the first and only human beings in history to see this. This is a real photograph of our planet. And there are many people who think that the environmental movement began with the space program leaving the Earth and having human beings see the Earth from space for the first time. Now, this is the greatest show not on Earth. Now, this is the actual landing site. And I, the reason I show this is because I want you to see here on the left bottom is a shadow of the lander, about ready to be humankind's first landing on another planet. Now, technically, the moon is not a planet, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Now, what most people don't know is that this was a computerized landing. About 20 seconds before the lander touched the surface of the moon, there was a, an alarm in the module. The computer was going to land the module on the edge of a huge crater which could have tipped it and killed the two astronauts inside. So what Neil Armstrong did with about 17 seconds left, he overrode the computer and he manually landed on the moon. And very few people know that story, that it was Neil's cool command and courage 17 seconds before that could have turned 
America's first landing on the moon into a terrible, terrible tragedy. If I told you that this is a photograph of Neil Armstrong getting ready to take his first historic step, how could you prove me wrong? Ah, okay. BB says, who would have taken the picture? This was actually Buzz Aldrin coming down the ladder. Neil had already come down, stationed himself a couple of hundred yards away with a camera, and he took this historic photograph. Some people say, oh, it was him, the chimp. He was still there, and he must have taken it. This is one of the most glorious photographs in human history, and this is called Earthrise. This was taken by our Apollo astronauts, and they, when they talk about it, even now, they say it's impossible to describe how lonely it was looking out across the bare lunar surface at all of the human beings alive in that small blue marble out there in the world. But I want you to remember that all of this is taking place in about eight minutes. So we're now traveling about a thousand miles an hour, about three G's. Atlantis is roll maneuver is complete. The uh, orbiter's in a heads down position on course for a 51.6 degree, 137 by 36 statute mile orbit. And we're probably going at about 10,000 miles an hour now. All systems in good shape. The engine's throttling down as Atlantis prepares to maneuver through the area of maximum dynamic pressure on the vehicle. Seeing one of these at nighttime is one of the great wonders of the modern world. And then before you know it, we're in space. Eight minutes. Think how far you can get on 495 in rush hour in eight minutes. We have gone from the surface of the planet 120 miles up, traveling at about 17,000 miles an hour. And you see it is a space truck. Now one of the things that we do a lot, of course, in space is photography. But I want you to notice that this astronaut is has got his feet kind of lodged under two places that will hold him because you have to find a place to attach yourself and everything you bring into space because remember everything floats so the foot restraints help keep him steady you notice by the way what he's wearing it's kind of warm in the shuttle so it's t-shirt shorts socks. Okay? Let's talk about the more practical things. How do you eat in space? Well, your pancakes, as I say here, are so light they actually float. But so do the people. So do the cans, if you bring any cans aboard. This guy's got two apples in front of him. He's not juggling. That apple's going to stay there. It's going to move a little bit because there are fans and air currents in the shuttle. But all he has to do is take a bite out of it, turn around, put it out here in front of him, come back a few minutes later when he's done whatever he has to do, and it'll still be there. Exercise on the shuttle is very important because for reasons we don't quite understand, you use, lose calcium in your bones. So the astronauts have to exercise at least 30, 40 minutes a day. But remember, he's tied down. Because otherwise he'd exercise himself right up into the ceiling. Now this guy is actually faster than any Olympic runner on record. 
Because when this photograph was taken, he actually jogged across the United States over 3,000 miles, and he did it in about seven and a half minutes. And that's pretty good speed. Because the shuttle is traveling at 17,500 miles an hour. The astronauts see one sunrise and one sunset every 45 minutes. I'm going to show you a little video clip of what it's like to be in the shuttle. And I want you to watch a couple things. I want you to watch the astronaut just flying through the shuttle. I want you to watch how he shaves himself. He's going to shave his head. But because you can't let the follicles of hair loose in the shuttle, he actually has a vacuum. There are just a couple of other really wild things. And at the end of the video clip, you're going to see them eating an orange. And it's just absolute hoot. I would love to be able to eat this one. You're just flying right through from room to room. Wouldn't you be, love to be able to do that in your home? And he's coming back. Isn't that great? You don't have to have tremendous athletic ability. Back he comes, flip-flopping around. Believe it or not, this guy's got a PhD in science. He doesn't look very scholarly, but... He's going to show you out the window now, see what it looks like. And that's the Earth from about 120 miles straight down. Now he's got a computer actually just like mine. He's communicating with ground. This is where in a shave. And all the hair goes in the vacuum. We are the experiment. Okay, here they're eating now. See the cans just kind of float in front of you. If you want to take a nap, you can nap in the ceiling. You can just drop on down. Isn't that great? That's how very, very thin our atmosphere is. That's water. That's what water does in the shuttle. It forms little gobules. Tons of equipment of all kinds. Of course, you never get away from the paperwork. And this is the shuttle approaching the International Space Station. That's the atmosphere again, very, very thin. That atmosphere that all of us depend on. And here we go. This is how to really eat an orange. Isn't that great? That's one of the reasons why astronauts love to bring M&Ms. Because they play games with each other. They just toss the M&Ms across the shuttle and see who can catch them. They love to bring tortillas. Because they pray, play frisbee and then they eat them. First couple of days they, they can bring fresh fruit. And then they do the kind of thing that we do. This is uh, the kind of food that you get in the store. Anything that needs rehydration or add a little bit of water to it is basically what they eat. This is my friend Barbara Morgan with DC's Astronaut. And you just kind of put yourself into a sleeping bag. You zip it up. The difference is you can sleep this way, that way, that way. And you can just use Velcro. Velcro is really, really good to use in, this, in space. And what you do is you just Velcro yourself to a wall. 
and you sleep, and your arms float. And because there is always something going on in the shuttle, most astronauts do wear the, the little black blinders to, if they're bothered by the light or not. And this is very, very dangerous work. Because remember, everything is traveling at 17,500 miles an hour. Now, you know people sometimes go to the top of the Empire State Building and they kind of, teenagers might sometimes do this, and they'll drop a dime off. It will actually go through the cement once it reaches the base floor. If you drop a dime off the Empire State Building, it'll go halfway through the cement. Now, that's not traveling that fast. In space, a fleck of paint traveling at 17,500 miles an hour will tear a hole through your visor, through your glove, through the suit, and in a matter of seconds, you're dead. And there are about 25,000 objects that are floating out there, mostly space junk that we put up there. You remember it wasn't that long ago that the Navy destroyed the satellite? Luckily, the dangerous part of the satellite was destroyed, but those pieces are still going to be circulating and eventually many of them will find their way down. Now this is a guy to me who's one of the most courageous of the astronaut corps. He was traveling in the space chair. You can see there's a little camera up here, there's a platform that Bruce is on. And he is actually traveling at 17,500 miles an hour. But because there's no air resistance in space, he doesn't feel it. Okay, how about a family photograph before we head for home? Unlike our family photograph, you can position people wherever you want them for the photo. You just have to watch out who you step on. And the shuttle lands. If it's good weather, back in Florida. If it's bad weather, in the desert in California. Sometimes with wobbly legs, there is a special 747, specially outfitted and specially trained pilots who bring it across the United States from California back to Florida where it's put together again. You've been a marvelous audience. Thank you so very much. Okay, so uh, that was a wonderful presentation. Uh, it, it, Dick has got a wonderful website that you should visit. It's called boomersinspace.com. And actually on that website, there is a couple of things that I noticed. And you, on your website, it says that people grow like a couple of, a few inches in space. I forgot to mention that. Thank you. Um, you actually grow four to six inches in space because the gravity here on the planet presses the vertebra of your spine together and once that releases your spine stretches and you will grow somewhere between four to six inches the problem is as soon as you land boom, you're back to where you were and many of the astronauts suffer pretty severe back pain some of the Russians have had to undergo uh, therapy because they've been in the space station for six to nine months one thing, if you're not planning to go to outer space, if you want the same effect, what I love to do, and uh, Bibi's here, she's a deep water instructor, you just go to the deep end of your pool, into the corner, you put your elbows up, and you can really feel your spine along it. It just feels so, so wonderful. Just, just try that sometime. For five or ten minutes, you'll just feel terrific. Also, I think your website said something about the space has an effect on your skin, the elast elasticity of the skin. Uh, this is one my wife says, why do you bring this up? Wrinkles disappear in space. So I told, I told, I, first time I told my wife that, she looked at me and she said, and why would you be telling me that? <laughs> what happens is, because again of the lack of gravity, the fluids tend to rise. Here, the fluids tend to puddle towards our feet and our heart works very hard to get them back up in this part of our body. In space, the heart works very, very, very uh, gently. 
In fact, there are medical uh, technicians who have said that in the near future, space station would be a wonderful place for heart patients because there's very little that the heart needs to do to pump in space because it's not fighting gravity. But in the process of those fluids rising, it fills out all of the cracks in the face and the wrinkles disappear. Except when you land, <laughs> they're back again. <laughs> all right. All right. So, um, just once again, I think we should thank uh, Dick Methia. Uh, just wonderful. And, um, you know, actually, over the last couple of years, I've had the uh, pleasure of escorting a couple of trips, one if by land, two if by sea. No, one was a land trip to Ireland. We, we had a good time, didn't we? <laughs> of course, I, you know, our, our, our tour guide, yeah, the tour guide, the driver, he was, um, he really earned his money with me because I sat right behind him and I was like the peanut gallery, you know, making all these comments. Like I would say things like, uh, well, you have to take us to the Lucky Charm factory. And he was like, the what? And I said, you know, frosted Lucky Charms, you're magically delicious. And he's like, we've never heard of that over here. That's a pure <laughs> Madison Avenue, you know, invention. That's nothing to do with Ireland. <laughs> and, uh, but you know what's amazing is that there's only 4 million people live in Ireland, but he said that there are 44 million Irish Americans of Irish descent. So I said, you mean there are 11 times more Irish people in America than there are in Ireland? <laughs> he said, yes. So they all, and they really don't really celebrate St. Patrick's Day over there. They just started to in recent years, it's kind of, but it was, it was never a big deal. But here in the United States, it's become a wonderful day of Irish pride. And, uh, but I was just chiming in the whole time, everything he said, and he finally got, he got fed up. In fact, what we, um, we were passing by this place where they had shot that uh, scenes from that movie that John Wayne was in, A Quiet Man. Of course, I had to say something. I said, well, you know, I've been called many things in my life, but never a quiet man. And he said, now's your chance. <laughs> that shut me up. Facilities provided by Fairfax Public Access, Fairfax, Virginia.